Hi, my name is Melissa. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and thank you for the speakers that we've had in the past. Um, the talks have been awesome, so thank you very much for that. Um, today I'm going to talk about a uh, multiplicity at most one theorem for the general spin and the general, what we call the general pin groups. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. So we'll talk just a second about the local gangros prasad conjecture um, and then the endoscopic classification of G-spin. So with that, but first I wanted to start with an example and you'll see why I want to do this example. Um, so anyway, it has to do with um, spherical harmonics. And if you're, anyone's interested in the local gangros prasad conjecture or the gangros prasad, prasad conjectures in general, Dick Gross has an awesome video out that he kind of explains things and uh, has some nice notes on it. So anyway, on the road to the GGP. Um, then this example comes, um, anyway, it comes from spherical harmonics. Um, so let um, S2 be the sphere. Um, x squared plus y squared um, plus z squared equals one. But this is as a representation of SO3. And Laplace showed that um, uh, the WLB, the vector space of homogeneous polynomials um, of degree one that are harmonic on R3. So in particular, that um, annihilate the Lap Laplacian. Um, then, like I said, Laplace showed that WL is an irreducible representation of SO3 of dimension 2L plus one, and it decomposes, um, et cetera. In fact, he showed that the subgroup of SO3, which fixes a point on the two spheres, isomorphic to SO2, so the circle, and it decomposes into linear um, characters, um, where z to the m is at like a root of unity. But the reason why I wanted to show this example today, because I don't have my slides to show the pretty spherical harmonics thing, but you can Google it, it's a very pretty thing, um, but is because this is a sphere. And so we'll make a balloon and say, happy birthday, Gordon, there's a balloon. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Okay. So um, with that, let's talk about G-spin and G-pin. Um, and I should say, for those of you that are like, G-spin, who cares? I don't want to care. I want you to care because I hope, like, we have a wide range of people in this room, right? We have graduate students and postdocs and senior members. And my prayer and my hope is, is that all of you that are working on something for classical groups, that you include G-spin, <laughs> right? As Colet Moglin has done on some occasions. So we'll talk about that. So anyway, the groups... Uh, G-spin, or the general spin group, and G-pin. Um, and if you say, I haven't heard of the group G-pin, that's okay. Takeda and I came up with this name, I think. Or so, um, But we'll talk about why we're calling it that instead of um, a multiplicative Clifford group. So let F be a field. Here we're just going to define these groups in general. Um, so just let the characteristic of F not be 2. And F is just any field. Um, BQ, a quadratic space. And this is the first time I've written on a talk board in two years because the University of Toronto has been closed. So if, I can, if you can't see something, just let me know because I feel like I've lost all my <laughs> remembrance. First, we have a tensor algebra. Um, that looks like this. Just like F directs sum B, directs sum B, tensor V, and so forth, and a two-sided ideal. So V tensor V minus our quadratic form times of B times one. Um, if V ends in B, this is in our tensor algebra. And then with this, we can define the full Clifford algebra which is just the tensor algebra modded out by this two-sided ideal. And we need, and so this is called the Clifford algebra. So, and I should say, we def um, work with the Clifford algebra in this way so that we don't have to assume anything is quasi-split or split, right? So it's a little different than what Maria Scari and Shahidi do, um, but it's, it's been a nice way for us to look at these things. Um, but when we do the endoscopic classification, we'll switch more back to, um, to them. So in any case, um, this is the Clifford algebra. This is a graded algebra. It's inherited by um, the following decomposition. So um, this is a direct product for n even, where m is a k module, where k is some ring. 
MTV minus or an odd Sometimes you're in. Um, and then the Clifford, Clifford algebra is then P, uh, TV plus modded out by the corresponding. What's that? Is it V instead of M? Uh, no. So this is an M module. Oh, okay. V is the vector space. So with this, um, and I shouldn't say those are not, um, these are not equal. Anyway, these are not equal, sorry, I have the wrong line. This here is called the even Clifford algebra, so, and we denote it by C plus V, and this is the odd part, which we denote by C minus V, and this is a direct sum then, um, and it equals the full Clifford algebra. So this is the even Clifford algebra. And this is the odd part. Yeah. Uh, can you say what M is again? So M is a K module. It's a module. What is K? A K is a ring. So it's just this is what the, the grading is inherited by. This is an I think Charlotte. How is M related to V? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. How is M related to V? What's that? Uh, this is just the. Uh, you introduce the grading for yes. the, the parts. Mm -hmm. So it's not just direct sum over N, uh, V, your tensor itself, N times? So are you asking like, is it TV equals like M tensor? Uh, I mean, uh, the tensor algebra is a direct sum over N of V tensor itself N times, right? Yes. And uh, are you just looking at the even, the part where N is yes. even? Yes, okay. about the, um, 
the um, multiplicative clipper proof or the G pin. This alpha might not be there, but we need this alpha in order for this to be surjective, and that's important um, in what we do. And this is the one you're probably more familiar with. So G spin projects down to SOB, right? And we have this projection going there. And then um, the Clifford algebra. equipped with a non-trivial involution. Right, that just switches the indices. Right, so it just switches things around. Um, and for, for all x in our Clifford algebra, um, the Clifford conjugation x bar equals um, alpha of x star. So for g spin, obviously it's just x star. Um, that's what we have there. And then this gives rise to the Clifford norm. Not subjective. Multiplicative group. What's that? Correct. It's not surjective on f rational points or something like that. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, um, but this is the reasoning of why we are calling this group G pin. Um, so when we first wrote up the results, we called it the Clifford group and the multiplicative Clifford group. That just didn't work. But we call it G spin. Good. So that's the definition of G spin. Um, and I would say that hopefully, I mean, some of you I'm sure know quite a lot about G-spin, some don't. 
Um, probably the things to highlight are these are relationships with the special orthogonal groups and the orthogonal groups, right? So before I move on, are there any questions about G spin or G thin? Yeah, spin, uh, spin? spin is by definition the intersection is G spin and G thin. But you know it's called thin. Huh? The intersection by thin. But right? I have to, I'm G thin. And G spin is a subgroup of G thin, right? That's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. No one <laughs> element in G spin. Do I have a Classical groups, it's a step beyond classical groups. It is a type BN and DN depending on the parity, but it is, um, that's why I mean by it depending on what you call a classical group. Um, uh, one big reason for us is because the representation theory of G-spin subsumes that of SO. And that's because if you have a representation of G-spin and um, you let the trivial character be, um, you let the central character be trivial, you should have a representation on SO. And probably one of our most important reasons um, is Shimura varieties, or at this point. Currently, um, when, um, they have to do a workaround using the, like Arthur's results of the endoscopic classification of SO, and they have to do a big workaround. Um, but if they had it for G-spin, it would make their lives a lot easier. Um, Um, and then, of course, the relationship with the Langlands dual group. So, um, for instance, the dual of G, uh, just the dual, not the length, if GSP2N is G spin 2N plus 1, and the dual of um, GSO 2N um, is G spin 2N over C, of course. Right. Okay. So with that, let's talk about the multiplicity at most one theorems. So let F be a local field here. Today I'm just gonna, um, we're only gonna talk about um, when the characteristic of F is zero. Um, let G be a reductive group. Oh. 
over F, H a reductive subgroup, um, I and sigma irreducible admissible representations of G and H respectively. And the question is, is how many times um, the sigma appear um, as a quotient of pi? And our question is, is when is the dimension less than or equal to one of this particular hum space? So we want to know when is the dimension of this hum space um, less than or equal to one. So this question was answered in 2010 um, for the non-archimedean case by Eisenbud, Borevich, Morales and Schiffman. And this was for the general linear groups, the unitary groups, and the orthogonal groups. Um, so I mean like GLN plus one and GLN and so forth. In 2012, uh, Wells Perger did it for the um, special orthogonal groups. Um, and it's my understanding he did it for um, the special orthogonal groups um, because somebody had told him it, like it would be a first step in proving the local GGP conjecture. Yeah, so what I mean by this is, um, like here, they would be GLN plus one and GLN or ON plus one. And so the unitary groups, the unitary groups, and then the special orthogonal groups. Um, and then in 2012, the Archimedean case was done by Sun and Zhu for those groups. And then our main theorem is to do this for G-spin. So basically to do the same thing, um, the dimension of this Hom space, so pi is an irreducible representation of the larger and uh, sigma for the smaller uh, for G. In and G-spin. And we call it a multiplicity at most one, um, even though the title of the paper is just multiplicity one, simply because it's a big step to go from less than or equal to to equal to, right? Because the equal to is the local gangrels prasad conjecture. Um, so some just highlights of the proof. And before I get into that, are there any questions? Anything I'm not clear this, about? This perhaps totally stupid, but it obvious that uh, you know it's clear that on embeds into on minus on plus one. But how about the pin groups? I mean, that's it's a very good question. Something that's proven in our paper. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> it's a good question, and it's not immediate, right? So you have the embedding of the Clifford algebras, right? Uh, natural embedding of the Clifford algebras, and um, like I think we have W as a smaller space. Um, so you have this natural embedding, um, and then you have, but um, to prove that G-spin embeds into there is a proof we have in the paper, so. Does that answer your question? Or, okay. 
Um, so here, just so that we're clear, we're going to just suppose we're not in the case for the dimension of V is 2K um, with K odd. Um, just because it just gets a little more complicated. So for the sake of time, um, let's sign um, the homomorphism going from G pin plus or minus one, which then sends the non-identity, um, the um, non-identity component to negative one. Um, And set minus g spin to negative one. Then the kernel of this map is g spin. And our involution The sigma energy is G star, where again star is switching the indices. If n equals 2k, n sine of G to the k plus 1 times G star, if n equals 2k minus 1. Um, So that's the involution um, that we're dealing with, and we have this vanishing theorem. So we have an orthogonal basis, um, E1 up to En, minus one to En. Um, this is for our vector space B, and the smaller one is W. Is the span of E1 to En minus 1. And we have E over F is a quadratic extension. And we have a, um, an automorphism beta going from our vector space. Um, and I just need this to set up some notation. Um, so that beta, beta squared equals uh, one. And the reason why that is so is because um, this map beta is sending from E1 to the Galois conjugate. Um, so that beta squared equals one. With this, we can now define this group um, G spin or set G spin tilde of E which is generated by G and this um, En to the K beta, such that G is in G spin V. Um, with the relation G beta equals beta G um, for all G and G spin. Um, And beta squared equals one. 
Um, and then we have this um, character, Kai, um, that spends, sends an element in this G spin tilde to plus or minus one. Um, and it sends, in particular, it sends beta to negative one. And this vanishing theorem Um, and it's the technical part of the paper is that the dual of the short space of G spin B, so the space of um, functionals, um, that this space is zero. And basically some of the problems with, the, this is just a technical thing, but the thing is is that in order to um, one of the issues like when working with G-spin is to show that your main, um, this vanishing theorem implies your main theorem. Um, it uses a corollary from AG, um, AGRS that um, was done for reductive groups, but the thing is is that you needed to know what the contragradient was, um, and that wasn't um, proven for G-spin anywhere or for G-pin. Um, so we have that. Um, so maybe I'll just write down for the sake of time the one for G pin. Um, but we needed to do those kind of things. And so in any case, and then some of the problems with, um, yeah, so the thing is, is that it might be tempting to say, like, because you have these exact sequences with G-spin and SO and, and G-pin and O, that you might be able to get it directly, right, um, using duals of these spaces. Um, as it turns out, you really can't do that. And so, um, what we ended up needing to do was using something called Frobenius descent and Harishandra descent, and then um, ended up using some isomorphisms with SO and O, um, but at a certain point. It's like if you tried to do it too early, it didn't work. If you tried to use the induction argument. So it's a, the AGR, yes, they used an induction argument, um, but it's based on an element of a central, um, uh, semi-simple element in the centralizer. Um, that is a direct product of like smaller classical groups, and that's not the case for G-spin, so it got stuck there. But what I wanted to talk about today a little bit is some new work that we're doing. Um, and so, um, and something about this involution um, was um, a difficulty, was coming up with precisely the right involutions, um, and they differ depending on the case, if you're in G-spin or G-pin, if you're, in the case of where n equals 2k and k is odd or not, um, the involution. So from what I understand from Gorevich is that the reason why they didn't do it for the special orthogonal group um, is because they couldn't quite figure out the involution. Um, so it's non-tricky, uh, it's a little tricky. Um, Waldberger figured it out for the special orthogonal groups, um, but this one is that for that. But um, the next thing, the reason why we want to do this, the reason why we did this multiplicity one was because we want to do the local DGP conjecture eventually, like not today. But there are several ingredients to a local um, Conjecture, and the conjecture basically says exact, I mean, this is like 
in the simplest of terms. This is exactly when um, the dimension of this HOM space, I don't remember, we were using pi and sigma or tau, when the dimension of a, a HOM space is exactly one, right? So less than or equal to one gives you, gives, you get from the multiplicity one from, um, but then some ingredients for doing this is multiplicity one, which is for G-spin is, is done now. Um, but we need to do the endoscopic classification of representations for G-spin, right? So when Wallace Bruge proved it for the special orthogonal group, I think it was still contingent at that time on Jim's work. Um, and then he got that um, done with some articles still outstanding. And then um, like finishing up the proof, there's obviously more to be done because you have this stuff with the Bogan pack is a whole nother thing. what um, Raphael did for the unitary groups and others and um, Wells Berger did for the special orthogonal groups. Um, but because I'm a postdoc of Jim's, we thought this might be a good, uh, Jim Arthur's, this might be a good time to do the endoscopic classification of representations, um, which the more I talk to people, um, I think is a wise idea. Um, so just, I, there are definitely people in this audience that are much more experts in any of this than I am. Um, but for, so Ben Zhu um, worked on this for GSP 2N and GSO 2N. So the, um, he didn't complete the endoscopic classification as part of his thesis was the local um, Langlands correspondence sort of, there's some ambiguity. Um, and then for, he's currently working on the global um, the Arthur's multiplicity formula, but he's working on that now. And basically on this for GSP2N and GSO2N, he's classifying the representations in terms of GLN, because that's what Arthur's book does, right? He does the, um, um, he puts um, things in terms of the representations of GLN. For Binzu, because the L groups for, G, uh, for GSP2N, like we said before, are GSPIN2N plus one and GSPIN2N, um, there's a spin representation that doesn't go into GLN. So um, he was not able, it's not a twisted endoscopic embedding for N greater than four. So he was not able to, um, to use Arthur's work. Um, he used Langland, uh, Lebez and Langlands instead. which they did the, um, the classification of SLN based on GLN, so going down and then he had to go the other way. Um, for us, um, we, in this, we, we plan on just, we're following Arthur. Um, Um, but here, um, there's a paper actually by Toby G and um, um, Olivier Tabby um, that do some of the work that we'll need to do, which is nice. It's Arthur's multiplicity formula for GSP4 and um, restrictions to SP4. Um, but they do it for GSPIN5, because that's equivalent to GSP4, as there's an accidental isomorphism there. Um, but in any case, um, here, we're going to assume um, quasi-split and then, yeah, um, hopefully be able to wipe that assumption away down the road, but for now, quasi-split. Um, so G-spin 2N plus 1 is split and um, We'll call, denote this as this. This is a quasi-split group. Well, alpha is in here. 
Um, and basically, the, I mean, the endoscopic groups, let me just put what that is. I'll do this exact sequence and then say what the endoscopic groups are. So here we'll be looking at G-spin slightly different. And I should say this work is very much in the beginning stages, beginning, beginning stages. Um, so, uh, but I'm just about out of time. Um, so the endoscopic groups are like basically just, maybe I'll write down one thing. So endoscopic groups. Um, and the endoscopic group is. Or A plus B equals N, and there's some further um, restrictions on A and B. Um, but the point is, it goes something like this, um, and this just makes it to where the similitude factors um, you have to equal each other. But it seems like a good time to do this. Um, some are working on the are working on the unitary um, endoscopic classification, doing work, some work there. Jim is working on um, the four outstanding papers, um, and so we'll have to generalize those. Um, when it comes to that. Um, so uh, there was a paper, there's a paper of Moglen that we thought that we were going to have to generalize, that there's probably one of Jim Arthur's he thought might be a sticking point for G-spin. Um, but as it turns out, she did it for G-spin, so I was very happy yesterday. Um, so that is good, which is why I ask you that if you're doing work on classical groups, please consider tacking on G-spin, <laughs> right? Doing the work to get that one done. But 